University of Oxford. And then, and then after that was a postdoc at University of California in Los Angeles. So presently she's the scientific director at the Gift of Life, the Marrow Registry, which is in Boca Raton. And she is gonna be talking about some of the work that she's, she's doing there today. Okay, so Fran, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. It's great to be here today and it's great to have the possibility to share with you what we do at Gift of Life. So let me start by telling you a little bit more about our history. So our history started in 1991 when Jay Feinberg, our CEO and founder, founded Gift of Life Marrow Registry. And Jay himself is a marrow transplant recipient. Since then, a few things have happened. So in our registry, we currently have almost 400,000 donors. More than 4,000 transplants have been facilitated and 732 collections have been performed in our collection center. So the bone marrow registry was founded in 1991. And then after in 2019, Jay opened our phrasis center here in Boca Raton, followed by the cell and gene therapy lab in 2020. So here in this picture, you can see our lab where we pretty much have uh, two different teams. We have one team that performs the CLIA testing on the stem cell products that are released for transplants. And then we have a cell therapy uh, team that I currently manage where we have uh, scientists that perform cryopreservation, cell processing, and isolation of specific cell subsets. But we are also in the process to build a uh, clean room with two ISO 7 suites where we intend to uh, generate clinical grade products. So in our um, center, we believe in automation. And here on the left, you can see a machine called CPAX provided by Sativia that pretty much isolates manually, um, sorry, automatically the um, plasma and the red blood cells. And here on the right, we have another machine, another automated machine called SmartMax that adds slowly the freezing components to the stem cell product. And the idea is to maintain the stem cell cold throughout the process. So we also have two CRFs, one provided by um, Thermo Fisher and the other one from Sativia, because again, when we uh, cryopreserve stem cells, we always try to make sure that the process is extremely slow so that we don't really affect the viability of the cells. In our lab, we also have two uh, liquid nitrogen tanks where we store our cryopreserved products. And here on the right, you can see a machine that we just purchased. It's called Clinimax Prodigy. This machine is a closed um, a cell sorter that can isolate different cell subsets, such as CD34 cells or T cells or mesenchyma stem cells. Also, you can see here on the left, this little chamber where the cells can be cultured after isolation. So what kind of projects do we have in our lab? So first of all, we support transplants by providing cryopreservation of stem cell products. And this project has become very important, especially during the pandemic. We also try and support the cell therapy field by providing study materials for researchers and biotechs that are in the field. And we are currently working for companies that um, manufacture CAR-T. We also intend to build a biobank of off-the-shelf products that are available on demand. And also as a scientist, I'm very happy to share that we just started a R&D project based on the expansion of in vitro stem cells in uh, vitro. So one of the problem um, that unfortunately patients have to face is the duration of the process uh, of finding a donor for a transplant. In fact, once a matching donor is identified, the, the time frame uh, for the patient to be able to get a transplant is between six and eight weeks. And that's due to donor availability, uh, collection center scheduling, physical exam, and mobilization process itself. And of course, COVID has even extended even more this uh, time frame. So unfortunately, uh, the result of this a uh, long waiting time is that some patients never get the possibility to get a transplant. And here, a gift of love, you wanna make sure that 
patients get a transplant when they need it. So we intend to build a biobank of off-the-shelf in vitro expanded hematopoietic stem, stem cell products. They are available when patients need them. There is evidence that the expansion of in vitro stem cells has the potential to be used as a method to increase the very low number of hematopoietic stem cells. So potentially the expansion of hematopoietic stem cells could give us the possibility to isolate the stem cells from one donor and generate multiple doses to help multiple patients. So in our registry, we currently have about 1,000 uh, super donor, which are donors with a very frequent HLA phenotype. Of course, it is not feasible to go back over and over again to the same pool of donors. So the scalability of the project really relies on the ability to expand these stem cells in vitro. So what are hematopoietic stem cells? Hematopoietic stem cells are a specific group of stem cells that can form two different um, lineage progenitors the lymphoid progenitors and the myeloid progenitors. The lymphoid progenitors will form B cells, T cells, and NK cells, whereas myeloid progenitors will generate granulocytes, neutrophils, macrophages, platelets, and so on. Here in our, uh, our gift of life, we have uh, two flow cytometers that we currently use to detect the lymphoid uh, progenitors, so the, the T cells and B cells. But also we perform an assay called colony forming unit assay to detect the myeloid progenitors. This assay is very straightforward. So we just plate the cells at a very low, con uh, low concentration in a six well plate and then in the presence of methyl cellulose. And then two weeks later, we count the colonies technically under the microscope. That's what I used to do during my PhD. But now in GitHub Life, we have a very interesting machine, a very efficient machine called Stem Vision that can actually count the colonies in just two minutes. So in two minutes, we have an idea of how many hematopoietic progenitor colonies are in our sample. So as I said before, our goal is to try our best to expand um, hematopoietic stem cells derived from peripheral blood. How are we going to do that? One approach is to use small molecules. Small molecules are very powerful tools for expanding hematopoietic stem cells. They play a key role in regulating key stem cell pathways, and also they allow a rapid phenotype-based high throughput screening. So the aim of this goal, this, of this project is to develop cocktails of cytokines and small molecules that can be used for the expansion of in vitro stem cells in, in the, sorry, for, they can be used for the expansion of hematopoietic stem cells while maintaining their stemness. So here you can see the experimental strategy that we intend to use. So first of all, we will collect the peripheral blood stem cells after consent and approval. Then we will use CDR4 as a marker to identify hematopoietic stem cells. So we will be performing cell sorting either manually by using the classic columns, or we, will, we can also use the prodigy. Then we will perform flow cytometry to assess the phenotype of the cells before culture expansion. And then we will culture the cells for eight days. So in detail, we will plate 3,000 cells per well in a 24-well plate in the presence of stem span, cytokines, and then small molecules. And then after eight days, we will validate the expansion protocols. So we will be performing flow cytometry to assess the presence of B cells and T cells. We will also look at the expression of markers that are associated with the long-term repopulating stem cells. And then we will perform colony assays, so the CFU assays, to assess the potency of the product. And then eventually, upon in vitro data, we will perform in vivo, um, in the in vivo experiments. And if everything goes well, we will then move to the clinical trials. So as I mentioned before, um, we will look at the phenotype of um, long-term repopulating hematopoietic stem cells. So our goal is not only to expand hematopoietic stem cells, but we wanna make sure that within this pool of cells that we are expanding, we still have long-term uh, repopulating hematopoietic stem cells, which are those very primitive stem cells that stay in a quiescent state. They are capable of waking up and 
making blood cells in the presence of an inflammation, injury, or blood loss. Uh, just to, to, to give an idea, after a transplant, these cells can stay in the bone marrow for a very long time and get reactivated when needed. The unfortunate the problem with these stem cells, though, is that the number is extremely low, is about 1% or even less of the entire population of HICs. How do we define these uh, long-term hematopoietic stem cells? They have, they display this phenotype. So they are positive for CD34, they are negative for CD38, positive for CD90, positive for CD49, and uh, negative for CD45 array. Also, there is a gold standard assay that is used for the characterization of, uh, for the identification of these cells. And this is pretty much a very straightforward secondary engraftment um, experiment in immunodeficient mice. So how do we select our donors? Donors come to give of life to donate for, for a patient. And then if the collection goes well and the donor mobilizes very well, we will ask them uh, if they're willing to donate more stem cells for our research. And if they consent, then they will be signing a IRB approved research consent form. So when it comes to small molecules, as we all know in the field, there are lots of small molecules that we could possibly test. And it's very hard to choose a library um, that can be used, that can be analyzed for the expansion of stem cells. So to start our project, we decided to purchase this library uh, that, is, uh, that has about 1,000 compounds. And these molecules are, have been reported to be biologically active. And also, they are safe, confirmed by some preclinical uh, data. So the outputs are three, mainly. So first of all, we want to exclude the possibility that these compounds can are toxic so they can kill the cells. So we will play the cells in the presence of these compounds to check the cell viability. Also, we wanna exclude the compounds that have a negative effect on the number of uh, long-term hematopoietic stem cells, because we really wanna make sure that during this process, we preserve the long-term hematopoietic stem cells. And ultimately, our goal is to find compounds that can promote the expansion of hematopoietic stem cells while maintaining their stemness. So how do we select the small molecules? There are lots of pathways that are involved in the uh, hematopoietic stem cell biology. For now, we will focus mainly on two pathways. The pathway that promotes the stemness of HICs by activation of notch signaling. And then we will also focus on the pathway that blocks the differentiation of these HICs by um, inhibition of the wind signaling. And as you can see in this image here, when the cells are plated, are cultured only in the presence of cytokines, it is true that they, they proliferate, but they also differentiate. So that means that the cytokines themselves are not enough for promoting proliferation of HSCs while maintaining their stemness. And also we can see here that if we cultured our cells only with small molecules, they would just die. So they need some support coming from the cytokines. So there is evidence that the expansion of HACs is a, is a very complex multi-stage process where the order and the timing of additional individual components has a huge impact on the expansion of hematopoietic stem cells. In fact, during my uh, postdoc in the UK, we reported that the activation of the notch ligand delta-1 at the beginning and the end of the expansion had a positive effect on the proliferation of HICs. However, if the cells were continuously exposed to this notch signaling factor, they would fail to reach the optimal expansion. So we suggest that the differential um, exposure um, that, that we suggest that differential exposure to factors may more closely reflect the function of HACs in the bone marrow niche. So we suggest a split culture where specific factors are changed maybe two or three days. So would then this result in a protocol that more closely mimics the behavior of HACs in the bone marrow niche? And, and again, as I said before, after culturing the cells in the presence of these compounds that are added to the cells at different time points, we will, have, we will validate our protocols by 
uh, performing flow cytometry, where we look at the presence of B cells, T cells. We will also investigate the phenotype associated with long-term hematopoietic stem cells. We will then perform CFUS and then eventually in vivo work. So the goal of this project is to take the cells from a super donor, expand them in vitro, make multiple doses and cryopreserve them so that when a patient needs a, is in need of a transplant, the cells are pretty much available the same day. So that means that we have to make sure that um, these cells are stable after cryopreservation. So we will definitely start some stability studies in order to make sure that the cells are still viable and potent after cryopreservation. So as part of our stability studies, we will look at the viability of the cells. We will also look at the presence of the long-term repopulating hematopoietic stem cells. And we will also perform a potency assay by using the stem vision machine. So another approach that has become very popular in the field is the co-culture of uh, hematopoietic stem cells with mesenchymal stem cells. There are studies showing that this co-culture system can benefit the expansion of hematopoietic stem cells. So here at GitHub Live, we will try something very similar, but we will target a specific population of mesenchymal stem cells that express these two markers, CD73 and CD39. So if we look at this bone marrow section, this section gives us an idea of what happens inside a bone marrow niche. So inside the bone marrow niche, we have these round cells here, which are hematopoietic stem cells. And also we have another group of stem cells, which is called mesenchymal stem cells. Some of these mesenchymal stem cells that you can see here in orange and blue, some of these cells are around the vessels. And because of this position, they are called uh, pericytes. These um, pericytes have a big uh, role in the in, uh, hematopoietic field in the sense that they produce some factors such as CXCL12 and angiopoietin 1 that play a key role in uh, hematopoiesis. So what are mesenchymal stem cells? Mesenchymal stem cells are a different group of stem cells. They can form bone, cartilage, muscle, and other tissues. During my PhD, I mainly focused on mesenchymal stem cells derived from the synovium, which is this membrane that lines the non-cartilaginous surfaces within the joint. And the reason why I focus on these specific stem cells is that the goal of my project was to try and regenerate articular cartilage. However, MSEs by now have been reporting lots of different tissues, such as in bone marrow, adipose tissue, peripheral blood, placenta, and so on. The problem with MSEs is that there is no a specific marker that defines these stem cells. So the only way uh, to define MSEs is by using a retrospective approach. So in order to say that a cell is a mesenchymal stem cell, three minimal criteria have to be met. So first of all, adherence to plastic in standard, standard culture condition. And also the cells have to express CD105, CD73, and CD90, and they have to be negative for CD45. And also they have to be able to differentiate into the three uh, multi-lineage um, progenitors. So they have to be able to form osteoblasts, chondrocytes, and ativocytes. Also, another um, limitation of the field is that when we take um, some mesenchymal stem cells from a tissue, those cells are extremely heterogeneous. For instance, in this, um, in this figure here, we can see that if we select 21 clones from a population of mesenchymal stem cells coming from a desanovium, we will see that these clones display different biological properties. Some of them are more chondrogenic, some are more adipogenic and so on. So, and these data have been also reported in, in vivo. So the message is that mesenchymal stem cells are extremely heterogeneous. So if we wanna target a specific clinical indication, we have to make sure that we isolate a mesenchymal stem cell subset with very specific biological properties. So that was, the goal of my research during my uh, PhD and postdoc as well. So after years of um, experiments and research, uh, I eventually identified a very small population of mesenchymal stem cells 
and that you can see here in red, this population comes from the synovium. And this population of stem cells is positive for CD73 and C39. Also, as you can see here in these figures, um, these cells are less proliferative and clonogenic than the other, than, compared to the other uh, population, indicating the fact that these cells might be progenitors. And so what are CD73 and C39? These two markers are two enzymes that together convert ATP into adenosine. And adenosine, as we know, is, uh, plays a very important role in the activation of immunosuppressants. Also, these two markers are expressed on lots of other cells, such as T cells, B cells, and so on. So back to my research, when we isolate this population of stem cells, we observe that this population of stem cells was positive for these two markers. And also these stem cells were highly chondrogenic and osteogenic compared to the other cell population. And these data were also uh, confirmed at gene level. So years later, this population was also discovered in other tissues, such as, sorry, such as adipose tissue and bone marrow. And recently here at Gift of Life, we reported the presence of these stem cells in mobilized blood as well. So this population is extremely interesting because it displays high chondrogenic properties in the synovium, also produces adenosine, and also expresses CD146 that is associated with pericytes. So with mesenchyma stem cells, they are located around the vessels and play a role in the hemopoiesis. So, what we suggest, and also, um, sorry, I want to mention that some collaborators of mine in Scotland decided to further investigate um, investigate um, pericytes from adipose tissue. And when they sorted pericytes and did RNA seq, they observed that pretty much all the C39 transcripts were only within the sorted pericytes, suggesting that these cells have pretty much a perivascular location. So this is our very preliminary result coming from our flow data. They show the presence of these cells within the mobilized blood as well. So back to this uh, cartoon here, our hypothesis is that these cells could possibly be pericytes. And so meaning that these cells could possibly support the production of hematopoietic stem cells. So we intend to start some co-culture studies where we pretty much isolate CD84 cells from one donor by using Prodigy. And then by using Prodigy, we isolate again the MSC subset, and then we culture them together to see if this kind of interaction has a positive effect